Hello and welcome everybody. Um, we are now flipped into presentation mode. Um, I hope you were able to wrap up your conversations. Welcome to the Stanford, Inter uh, Stanford um, Emergency Medicine Innovation Symposium, uh, our inaugural first one ever. Um, the purpose really of this conference is to really give space to the future of emergency medicine, um, including not only what could happen, but also what probably should happen. Um, speaking of what should happen, hopefully our technical uh, um, day will go pretty well. Um, I'm going to give over to Jason Lower, my co-director, in one second to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but please forgive us as we're using somewhat new software to make this all happen. Um, before we start, I wanted to give a quick thanks and shout out to the STEMIX team. Um, Jason, my co-director here, um, has been invaluable in this process. Um, but I'd also love to thank some of our digital strategy team from Stanford, including Ryan Rivera, Matt Stralo, Sam Shen, and then especially to some of our other health from uh, Sue Copa and Adrene as well, who have been invaluable in uh, making this happen. So Jason, why don't you take us away and share a little bit about um, what's gonna happen today. Sure, thanks, Dan. I'm Jason Lowe. I'm one of the pediatric emergency medicine physicians here at Stanford. Uh, welcome to STEMI X 2021, everyone. We're going to start now. So I'm, I'd love to introduce uh, Dr. Andra Blomkans, who is the chair of um, emergency medicine at Stanford, as well as a loud advocate for the future of innovation with emergency medicine. And she can take it away with our uh, keynote speaker. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, inaugural Stanford uh, STEMI X. Um, from Stanford Emergency Medicine. I'm very happy and enthusiastic to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Richard Zane. Dr. Zane is a professor and chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Colorado Medical School with faculty based both at the University of Colorado and Denver Health Medical Center. He has extensive experience in designing and implementing systems of quality, emergency care, access, and clinical integration. He has been applauded for being able to apply modern industrial engineering and informatics practices to healthcare and science. He recently led a complete redesign of the University of Colorado Hospital Emergency Department, and that new model of care has been recognized, emulated, and often visited by visitors both from the United States and internationally. He is a leader both in the academic and private sectors, a true model as an expert in emergency medicine innovation. And I'm very happy to introduce my dear colleague and dear friend, Dr. Richard Zane. Thank you, Andra. Uh, my mom wrote that and I didn't think you'd actually write, read the whole thing, but thank you very much. <laughs> I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. We practiced this almost 6,000 times in the last half an hour, and I'm hoping that it works. It appears as though it is. So what I've been asked to talk about today is looking beyond the emergency department. Um, I have dual roles here at the University of Colorado. Um, I'm the chair of emergency medicine and in that role I have oversight for the academic practice of emergency medicine, community practice of emergency medicine, urgent care, uh, virtual care, and then from the health system side I'm the chief innovation officer and as chief innovation officer I lead our system in partnering with industry to be pragmatic and solve uh, challenges in healthcare. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but before I do, let me just tell you about my conflicts and disclosures. Um, I'm a deeply, profoundly conflicted individual, uh, but the real conflict is that I'm a public employee and I work for the University of Colorado uh, on the Anschutz Medical Campus in Colorado. So. I am representing my own views. Uh, and because I am who I am and I tend to speak the way I do, uh, please do not correlate anything I say to the University of Colorado, the state of Colorado, the Board of Regents, the governor of the state of Colorado, I'm representing myself. Also, I work with a lot of companies, um, a lot, and I'm gonna talk about some of them today. Um, I have no personal investment in the companies. I am on the board of some of these companies, but the University of Colorado or UC Health or both um, have invested in many of these companies and I represent their investments. Uh, so those are my conflicts. So I can't talk without mentioning COVID. Um, and I wanna apologize for not being there in person. Um, but 
I want to reiterate or iterate um, how proud I am to be an emergency physician. And we all go through different times in our career. Um, and I think that this past year or 14 months has punctuated um, why we exist. So I am beyond proud to have stood on the front line uh, with my colleagues, taking anything that comes and leading in this pandemic. And people will ask me, you know, what's it been like um, besides being exhausting? And I know that everybody listening is, is exhausted. Um, it feels as though this is what we were built for and why we exist. So thank you uh, for leading with us. So I want to talk a little bit about the scope of emergency medicine, and I'm not going to read this slide to you because all of you can read, but let's talk about the history of how this happened. So right around the Korean War uh, in the 1950s, people began expecting the access to episodic care. Uh, and emergency departments started to become common in hospitals. Before then, they weren't common. Uh, it was common to go to the hospital, you'd call your doctor and your doctor would meet you there. And then in the ensuing decade or so, decades, uh, it became more common for doctors to practice exclusively in emergency departments. And then uh, in 1979, after some heroic politics, uh, the American Board of Medical Specialties recognized emergency medicine as a specialty. And I remember when Stanford did, and it was applauded um, across the country, and I had the privilege of being one of the folks that came to Stanford to advise the dean, uh, and then Andra came, and the rest is history, as you know. But I want to take you back even further. Um, I'd love for you to think about thousands of years ago and how we came to be in these different specialties. Asclepius, hopefully you recognize him. Um, medicine was an iteration of religion um, and practice. Uh, and physicians were godlike um, if they were even physicians. And then let's go forward. And there became this bifurcation of physicians and barber surgeons. So the first duality or binary categorization. So you would go to a physician or a priest um, if you weren't well, um, and you would go to a barber when you needed a haircut, a shave, or something lanced or something removed. So let's go in the future, and now let's look at Osler and Jonas Salk, thinking what would Jonas Salk think about uh, this year uh, with what's happened with this pandemic and the evolution of vaccines and what came out this morning about the Johnson & Johnson, which I know is paralyzing everybody. But let's think forward even more. So. The question that I have is now we have the American Board of Medical Specialties that has created and authorized 24 different specialties, and we are incredibly proud to be one of them. Beyond proud, it was an incredible achievement. But the specialties are really based around organ systems, molecules, and procedures. So the question that I have is, does that really fit? It fit for a long time, but does it still fit? Does it still fit that every specialty should be based on an organ system or a procedure? Because we know that most advances, most innovative thinking happens at the intersection of disciplines, multidisciplinary. So does it still fit? Now think about the revolution that we're currently in. Uh, if we go back a thousand years to the um, to the age of agriculture and then the industrial age, a couple hundred years, uh, and then computing, the internet, how we communicate with each other, and that was a couple decades. And now we're in this cognitive revolution where everybody has a smartphone. We have prescriptive analytics. Uh, we partner with machines to help us make decisions. So think back to the American Board of Medical Specialties, our heroic achievement of becoming a specialty, and then think about where we are now. And just ask yourself, does it fit? I know this is a little controversial, but just ask yourself, does it really fit? So if we think about what we do, the scope of emergency medicine, um, it's really all over, right? So we are acute, episodic, unscheduled care, anything, anytime. Um, we love to take care of emergent patients, but we take care of a lot of urgent care and a lot of primary care. We define ourselves sometimes as a safety net. 
Um, but we're really beyond what an emergency or accident is. And we are a fulcrum between inpatient, outpatient care, uh, between a lot of different areas and think about what we know and how we think. So this is not maybe not a popular thing to say, but has the American Board of Medical Specialties simply put us in silos as preventing us from thinking outside the box? Because in the last year, think about how many times you've had to think outside the box. And it's a ridiculous slide, but my dad always told me that you deserve what you tolerate. And we're tolerating this. So what are we tolerating? We're tolerating a healthcare system that is almost unnavigatable. It's beyond crowded where access is a challenge. It's paralyzingly expensive, paralyzingly expensive, and it's not particularly safe. So are we just putting a square peg in a round hole? Do we continue to push this square peg? Are we Sisyphus rolling that boulder up the hill? Because the scope of emergency medicine is vast. Uh, and this is just the things that you know about and see and that we have fellowships in. Sports medicine, critical care, EMS, disasters, toxicology, wilderness medicine, space medicine, and I'm not even naming um, ultrasound, pediatric emergency medicine, keep going. But what is common about these? Well, it's locus and acuity. But if we were to say, what is, you know, what is the characteristics of an emergency physician? Uh, we're comfortable with any acuity, comfortable with any pace. We are relatively comfortable making life altering decisions without the full picture. How many times have people asked you what the serum porcelain level is? Um, how many times have someone asked you what the ESR is or something that you don't need to make a decision. And we're comfortable making those decisions. We're also comfort comfortable pivoting. We've made the decision, we're going down a path, something changes, we turn right, we turn left. We do that every single day and we do it on the spot. So my message is what better training is there for the modern age of healthcare? Because we are going through a transition at a pace that no one ever could have predicted ever. So I think everybody recognizes this guy, Darwin. And Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. We have awards named after him, the Darwin Awards. Darwin described evolution as gradualism, slow changes over hundreds of years. But is that really what's happening? I mean, I don't think this is gradual. So Another revolutionary anthropologist, Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote The Mismeasure of Man and Punctuated Equilibrium, had a different theory of evolution that he described punctuated equilibrium. And punctuated equilibrium is something just happened that is significant and sudden, and that's how we change. Not gradual over decades and centuries and thousands of years, but suddenly. So I'm going to ask you, do you think we've just been punctuated? Do you think that in the last decade with the advent of technology everywhere and now in the last year, have we been fundamentally altered? How many times have you pivoted? How many times have you thought differently this year than you did last year? So think about this gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium. And I would ask you if you've been punctuated like Polaroid or Kodak or the taxi industry, or even Blockbuster or Barnes and Noble. I'll bet you there are people who are listening to this who've never been into a Blockbuster. I grew up trying to go to Blockbusters. So let's think about the concept of what innovation means. So innovation used to mean some type of a device. It was focused on moving or changing a device. But now we're in this age of the internet of all things. Every single thing we have is connected to something else. And all of these things give off this incredible amount of data. So let's think about innovation in a different way. So maybe innovation is seeing something you've seen before and are seeing it through a different set of eyes. Maybe the eyes of a patient, maybe the eyes of a child, maybe the eyes of a provider and apply a different perspective. And then think about things that you thought we've done this a hundred times or a thousand times. We've done it every day for five years and say, maybe this is not the right thing to do. So this has been my approach. Um, and I 
got permission from Andre to talk about what we've done. Um, and I was lucky enough to be a grand round speaker two years ago, and I'd like to update you on some of the things that I talked about two years ago. So we approached it, the healthcare system to think about what innovation is and to think about it in a hyper, hyper pragmatic way. So we said, what's our strategy? And innovation is one of the core pillars of our strategy. Um, and what do we wanna do? Um, what we really wanna do is break things. We wanna think about what are the problems in a very ethnographic, deliberate, definable way that face healthcare? And how are we gonna solve those problems? But who are we? Because we can't be all things to everybody. So sometimes we're gonna find a problem that we just haven't solved and someone else has. In which case, we are gonna not be innovative, we are going to be imitative. And we're gonna think about others who've done it and see if we can apply this. But when we truly need to be innovative, meaning develop things that are new to the world, what are we going to focus on? And how are we gonna focus on that? So the first thing we did is we said, what are, what are our assets? What differentiates us? So I'm very fond of saying this, that I don't have a crimson H or a scarlet S on the side of my building, which means that I have to think about why would technologists and digital health wanna come and work with us in Colorado? And if we wanna be pragmatic, we have to say, how can we differentiate and what do we have? Because we can't be all things to everybody. So we thought we have a healthcare system. So 12 hospitals across the front range of Colorado. We have a best in class medical school and academic medical campus. And we have an electronic health record. Now Epic may just be a four letter word to some people, uh, but to us, and this would seem ridiculous if someone from Google or Apple were in the audience, and maybe they are, uh, but we have a single mature instance of a health record. And the IT strategy and the innovation strategy are one and the same. So we think about our electronic health record as a horizontally and vertically integrated backbone learning validation laboratory. We're also in Colorado, uh, which is a great place to come live. People wanna visit. And it was third in the country for digital health deals for the last three years. We also have access to capital. We started two funds, a $100 million growth fund and a $50 million um, early stage fund. So we can invest in companies and have skin in the game. We also built a pretty interesting virtual health system. Um, and I just admit to you that I dislike the term virtual health and telemedicine uh, because it, there's nothing virtual about it. It's actual care, it's not virtual care. It's technology enabled care. Uh, the other thing we did is we said, what are the pain points of working with academic health systems? There's the three letter acronym, IRB, um, legal processing, financial processing, um, those sorts of things. So we worked with our research infrastructure to think about how to work with a healthcare system from the perspective of technology. What would a startup do? What would a large company do? What they don't want is three months to IRB approval. So we streamline our academic processes. So with the guiding principle of everything has to be in your inbox. You send me a contract, I turn it around and it sits in your inbox. We go to the IRB for approval for validation or for a clinical trial and we get an answer in six days. We wanna present to our virtual, our uh, venture capital fund, uh, we get an answer in a week. Everything goes into your inbox. And then we built a data infrastructure. So we were Google Cloud's first healthcare client. And we built a system where every discrete piece of data that's entered in our electronic health record every night from our system, the children's hospital system, the university system goes into a data warehouse, gets synthesized and normalized. And then other data comes into, including monitoring data, uh, remote patient monitors. If we assign uh, Apple Watch or whatever we're gonna use also goes in here, as well as claims data. And then we put tools on top of this data warehouse so that we could partner with industry to mine those data. So this is these are our assets. This is what we bring to the table and this is what we talk about. So we think about how do we partner with industry through the innovation life cycle? How do we source opportunities? How do we vet them? How do we iterate and implement, validate, evaluate, and then scale? So what I tell our partners is that we're in it for the long haul because our ideal partners 
are ones where we've mutually identified a problem that needs to be solved. And we don't just solve it for us. We think about the two through 1,000 other healthcare systems in the country. We have to use it. So we are a customer. We have skin in the game. So we all need it to work and we're into the end. So we're going to scale with you. And then from an investment thesis, and I'm not a venture capitalist, you're actually going to hear from a couple of venture capitalists today. Listen to them, not to me. Uh, but we think that we de-risk investments because we get information that Kleiner Perkins or Menlo Ventures can't have because we've worked in this system. We know the problem. We know the team. We see that it's working. Um, and we have self, we believe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because if we like the team, we know the problem is real and we're starting to solve it. We need the thing to work. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we've partnered with other investment companies to do sidecar investments, to follow investments. So if HEP Capital and UC Health both think that something is worth investing in, um, the odds are it's going to be worth investing in. So this is our portfolio and how we break it down. Now we focus on the last mile. We do not um, invest in molecules, therapeutic devices, and I don't invest in faculty IP. The university does, but I don't. I invest exclusively in building solutions for that last mile. And we spend a lot of time on change management and how ethnographic something is. So I always say that my job is to run through the briar patch because it's not just, is there a problem? Is there a solution? But will people use it? Because if providers won't use it or patients won't use it, it, it doesn't matter how great it is. And you've all been involved in things like that. So from a high level, we think about patient experience, personalized medicine, data, AI, wearables. We focused on behavioral health and VR and AR. Um, and that's it. And I'm gonna talk to you about some of the, the challenges that we've tried to solve. So we partner with technology and think very specifically, what are the problems and how can we solve it? Now we had, I think 600 companies come to us in the last two years to wanna work with us. And the single worst experience I have is when a company will pitch to me and they have an out of the box solution for a problem that they have not investigated or involved me in identifying. And it just won't work. It's not implementable. So I wanna talk a little bit about one of the problem statements and we start everything with a problem statement. So our problem statement was guideline compliance. And like all things, um, we started in the emergency department and this became um, also a self-fulfilling prophecy. The reason why we started with guideline compliance is because I was a new chair I had an EMR that I was not familiar with. I knew that we didn't have guideline compliance and I couldn't get guidelines embedded into the EHR. And I didn't have enough money to go and buy an out of the box solution. So I partnered with a company to build it. But the problem statement is that 85% of every diagnosis in medicine has a guideline associated with it. And those guidelines will improve care by some ridiculous number from five to 75%. And that could be the same outcome for cheaper or it could be life or death and anything in between. And then from a provider perspective, we have alert fatigue. There's not a chance that we can read everything published. Even if we stayed up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we'd only keep up with half of it. And we're clicked into submission. So our guiding principles for clinical decision support is that it has to be the path of least resistance, fewer clicks and not more clicks and bulletproof right. So when we have a partner, that's what we say. So we started off in the emergency department thinking about Epic and how to make Epic not just another four letter word. And how do we integrate? And how do we keep one of our guiding principles, which is everything has to be within provider workflow. Because if you're in an Epic environment and I ask you to go lead, lead, leave and look at a PDF or look at a piece of paper, the likelihood that you'll do that goes down and down and down. So we started off with routine things like a headache. And you would be amazed at how people do not follow regular guidelines for headaches. And then we got more, you know, more adventurous uh, and ECMO. And then oncology saw this, thoracic surgery saw it, surgery saw it, and the embedded pathways would make it into other specialties. Now these pathways 
are actually not within Epic. They appear as though they are. They're in an Amazon server in New Jersey. But when you follow the pathway and you click, it automatically populates the orders, automatically populates the electronic health record. So at the bottom, you accept and everything is done for you. But what I can't imagine is not having had this system before the pandemic. Because as you know, guidelines were changing every seven minutes, exaggeration, but definitely every hour. And instead of having to give out, send out emails like this has changed, this is new, do this, don't do that by every specialty, by everybody from paramedics to intensivists, the pathways would get updated. They get updated every, in the beginning, twice a day. And then if you follow the pathway, it was up to date. So it became the path of least resistance, the easiest way to do something. And we had exponential scaling. And now this company that we work with is in you know, a few hundred healthcare systems across the country. We were the second one uh, to use them. So the second problem statement, sepsis. So this is one of those problem statements where I was thinking about being very pragmatic. You all know that sepsis is the biggest killer uh, in the hospital. And when we were looking at our healthcare system, uh, we were not happy with our performance around sepsis. And instead of saying we need A, B, and C because we want to be you know, this and that, um, we said if we were 75th percentile last year, 40 people would not have died. And that's the way in which we convey the importance of the problem statement. Um, and despite everything we had done, sepsis was not being solved. So we have a virtual health center. Um, I think a lot of people have a virtual health center. Uh, we have everything from safety view, which is people looking at patients in bed across our whole healthcare system uh, to make sure they don't elope or fall out of bed. People who have a little delirium. Um, we have centralized te telemetry, centralized capnography. Um, and then we have a virtual behavioral health center uh, and integrated into this and this room this is one of the five rooms there's two to three icu nurses a 24-hour emergency physician advanced practice provider and an intensivist either on site or on call and like a lot of people we have virtual urgent care and virtual everything care um, and virtual icus but we set up virtual surveillance uh, which means we wanted a pilot for how we can surveil a certain set of patients and we decided on sepsis as the first one. So we combined four algorithms. As you know, sepsis, sepsis algorithms and scores are incredibly sensitive and nonspecific. So the noise ratio to actual is super high. So we combined four algorithms to make them more accurate. We had real-time monitoring of the electronic health records. So anything that comes off a patient would go into these algorithms, including uh, vital signs, um, discrete elements in the electronic health record. When the score would come to a certain point, the nurse would do an evaluation of the patient, more often than not looking with the camera, looking at the electronic health record, reviewing the data, and remotely order a CBC and a lactate. Not rocket science. Here's the hardest part, and this is the change management running through the briar patch, which was when we recognized someone who was at risk of sepsis, we would remotely, the emergency physician would remotely order bolus fluids and antibiotics on patients who are sometimes hundreds of miles away. So we had to convince the medical ICU, the surgical ICU, hospitalists that we could evaluate sepsis better from often 100 miles away than they could, even though they were one floor above or one floor below. So we did a three month pilot and we reduced recognition and treatment by two hours and decreased mortality by 30% and eliminated 180,000 bedside alarms. Now, everything that came off of this pilot went into our data warehouse, and we're now working uh, with a large tech company to think about how to produce those algorithms. But the secret sauce really wasn't the decision to give antibiotics and fluids earlier. That's pretty easy. It was the last mile, that running through the briar patch, getting providers to understand uh, that we could remotely do that better. And now we do it in all of our emergency departments as well. So that was our second problem statement. The next problem state was remote monitoring. And I think that many on this call um, have thought about remote monitoring and probably done remote monitoring. Um, but our problem statement was that remote monitoring uh, is we need it because our hospitals are full. Um, patients are often asymptomatic 
until they become symptomatic, but sometime between asymptomatic and symptomatic, something happens and we'd love to see it. We wanna be proactive, but from a remote monitoring perspective, the devices were either too expensive or not medical grade. And I think everybody's seen more and more about Apple watches and about all of the monitors either being not accurate or too expensive or often feeding data that's not important. Um, and we can talk after if you'd like about how Apple decided to use atrial fibrillation uh, as one of the things that they were gonna measure. Uh, and it's, it's a perverse incentive to have done it. But anyway, too expensive or not medical grade. So we partnered with a company called BioIntelligence. It was an asset transfer from a company called Strive. Um, the CEO uh, was the CMO for Qualcomm. He left Qualcomm. Um, we led the investment in this company and we walked it through the FDA. We did the human factors engineering uh, and then we started to think about how we could use this. So this device is really interesting for two reasons mainly. It's medical grade and it's cheap. So we can put it on anybody, uh, put it on, it turns itself on, a patient can put it on themselves, it can be upside down, backwards on the wrong side and it recognizes where it is and turns itself on, automatically connects to either a hub or a smartphone. And it does continuous skin temperature, heart rate, rest rate, coughing frequency, uh, measure sleep, fall detection, gait analysis, and we can even tell if it's you or not. So we thought, what an interesting thing, very cheap. We could put this on a lot of people. We could remotely monitor from our virtual health center. And we would do what everybody's trying to do, which is take advantage of Medicare Advantage patients, the patients that we had tons of risk yet. So patients like COPD, heart failure, diabetes, all the ones that you know about. And we could identify patients who uh, were at risk before they became symptomatic, intervene, prevent emergency department visits and hospitalizations. And our pilots, worked. And then COVID happened. And we needed another remote patient monitoring path or avenue. So we thought about how do we discharge patients earlier? Or how do we send them home directly from the emergency department with oxygen um, and avoid an admission? And this was our answer. So we eliminated almost one and a half days length of stay from inpatients by being able to send them home. And we think we avoided almost 10% of our otherwise would have been admitted to the hospital COVID admissions. But then another interesting thing happened with, a, with an investment from Phillips um, and a grant from the DOD. Um, we discovered that we could detect COVID before a patient became symptomatic and before they were PCR positive. And then when we started vaccinating, this is the bio button, which is a smaller, even cheaper version uh, that does episodic uh, vital signs, not continuous. We could detect alterations in temperature that were symptomatic, but never elevated to a temperature. So the delta temperature from minute to minute or hour to hour became indicative of someone being symptomatic. So we thought, what about these hundreds of people, thousands of people, who are very old, who are getting uh, COVID vaccinations, and can we differentiate um, what is or predicted to be a side effect of vaccination versus active COVID versus other? Other. We started with healthcare workers, and now we're doing a pilot with a few hundred um, skilled nursing facility members. So, and we just recapitalized that company, uh, and it's it's going well. So the next problem statement: diabetes. So diabetes is by definition, a mathematical disease. What's your glucose level? How much do you weigh? And you know the disease. So we partnered with Dexcom and other companies to think about how we can set up a remote patient monitoring virtual diabetes center. Because, and this was very pragmatic, our chief of endocrinology uh, requested to hire more endocrinologists and build a building. Um, even if we wanted to build a building and hire more endocrinologists, there weren't more endocrinologists available and there was no place to build a building. So we thought, what can we do to virtualize diabetes? So we thought, what does an endocrinologist do? What does a primary care physician do? What does a pharmacist do? What does a diabetes educator do? What can behavioral activation do? Meaning when your glucose goes up, your cell phone tells you your glucose has gone up. When you forgot to take your medicine, it reminds you to take your medicine. When you haven't gone for a walk, it reminds you to go for a walk. And we did this all out of our virtual health center. 
So these are the patients that we targeted, really the patients who had uncontrolled diabetes or severe diabetes. And we said, what are the staff required? What are the interventions gonna be? And we only started this six months ago. And this is a typical patient journey. So patient gets diagnosed with new onset diabetes, gets started on a medication if they've been able to see a primary care physician. So we identify patients who were referred to endocrinology from primary care who couldn't get into their endocrinology because there was a long wait to get in. Um, we identify patients in endocrinology who had severe diabetes or new onset diabetes. So we enrolled them in the diabetes home and remote care. Uh, we essentially surrounded them with resources at home, remote patient monitoring, glucometers, um, and then a lot of behavioral activation and touch points throughout the day. And then this is a typical journey. What happened in three months would have taken probably three years if the patient was, was compliant and came to endocrinology or came to primary care because what we could do in parallel was previously done in series. So you go to the endocrinologist, they start you on a new medication, you come back in three months or in six months, they alter it. Um, and we could do that every three days. So in three months, this is a typical patient, lost eight miles, decreased significantly their hemoglobin A1C and went from two medications to one medication. And on average, in three months, we reduced hemoglobin A1C by 22%. Now, again, everything that we've done here goes into the cloud. We build algorithms and then partner with industry. So in this case, the remote patient monitoring or the glucometer companies to embed this. And hopefully, over time, it becomes more dependent on AI than it becomes dependent on humans. So two more, pharmacotherapy. Um, this is a company that I told you about two years ago. So remember when I said one of our requirements, partnerships, is that we will help a company scale? So as you know, indications for medication change. A third of all prescriptions are left at the pharmacy. Everything is overprescribed or doesn't work, and it's really expensive. $340 billion a year expensive. So we partnered with a company called RX Review. This is the second company we started working with. They were uh, three people in a garage here in Denver who had this great idea. Uh, they had some seed funding. We got a grant from the state and we built clinical decision support around pharmacotherapy, which then evolved, pivoted uh, to continue to be clinical decision support, but really be real-time benefit check. And our big coup was that it worked so well that it became part of the native Epic. So instead of it being an overlay, it's actually part of Epic. And when our providers use it, they don't even know that they're using it because it looks like a suggestion for something that's in the patient's insurance. So it goes into the electronic health record, looks at guidelines, looks at indications for medications. It then goes to the payer and says what is prescribed by, what is covered by the payer. And then surfaces cost estimates and suggestions. So we started off slow. Um, last time I came to you, it was just us, Epic, RX Review, and the Swift RX tool. And now, two years later, we have a lot more partners that are using it, and it's across the country. Uh, 150 million patients, 2,000 health systems, 200,000 providers are using it. And we think we've saved over a billion dollars and almost 260 bucks per patient. So this, hopefully, will be um, an exit soon, but that's the way we try and work with companies. So this is the last one I'm gonna tell you about. The problem statement is hypertension. So sometimes you gotta swing for the fences. Um, as you know, hypertension is a silent killer. Um, 1.4 billion people on earth have hypertension and treatment is for the most part bimodal. It's usually medication and some type of lifestyle modification. And if treatment happens, it's usually serial, like the diabetes example, which is you get recognized having hypertension, you start a medication, you follow up in some number of months, and then you continually serially get managed. So we thought, let's partner with a company and think about how we can democratize hypertension management. So we had a company, we had a, an investor, um, serial entrepreneur, um, who wanted to work with us. We found a scientist actually in Palo Alto um, who had developed a way that you can use your camera on your cell phone to take your blood pressure. And we developed AI and we're validating it now so that you can take your blood pressure with your phone, which means most people 
have a smartphone and instead of using a sphygmomanometer um, or having to go to the doctor's office or urgent care, you can take your own blood pressure. You can then enroll and then we can connect you with the primary care physician, cardiologist, AI, prescribe medications remotely, monitor you, behavioral activation and nudges and get your blood pressure under control. At least that's what the, the vision is. So our startup got a lot of press, at least for me, it got a lot of press, um, mostly because the guy that we partnered with is a guy who founded Siri uh, and we're off to the races. So hopefully uh, this works, but I think everybody that has worked in innovation knows that you have to be comfortable with failure. You have to be comfortable with pivoting. You have to be able to make decisions uh, and say no to a lot of things. And you have to change courses a lot. So my message is, who better than emergency physicians to work in innovation? Because we recognize illness and not illness. We always know there's a better way to do something. The world is our oyster because we can care for anybody, anywhere, anytime. We understand inpatient, outpatient management, and we're early adopters. So thank you. Hello, all right, great. I just got kicked off Remo uh, and just logged back on right at the perfect time. Rich, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Uh, one question asked uh, was, you know, what does emergency medicine look like uh, in 10 years when we're starting to get right? And what does it look like if we don't do it correctly or just keep doing it now? So I think that I can't predict the future. I don't know what it's going to look like in 10 years. Uh, but what I can tell you is that it is so different than it was 10 years ago. Uh, I believe that we should describe ourselves in the context of acute, episodic, and unscheduled care. Um, I walk everybody back to the origins of critical care, right? If you think about the origins of critical care, the reason why anesthesiologists are intensivists is because people would be intubated in the operating room and they were the only ones familiar with ventilators because they were anesthesia machines. So they became intensivists. And then cardiologists became intensivists because their patients were in the ICU. And then pulmonologists became intensivists because they were experts in the lungs and everybody was on a ventilator. But from the perspective of, if you were to ideally train someone before a fellowship, I think emergency medicine is the ideal training for critical care. Um, and I think that's for a lot of things. So what does it look like in 10 years? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. What I can tell you is that um, everybody I've hired in the last three years, and I've hired about 100 providers, has in their contract that they must be facile and willing to do virtual care, episodic care, um, and out of hospital care. Um, and I think that that has to be part of our training. Okay, great, great. Um, there's a question that says, as an individual, I'm fed up with the situation you've described. Um, along your dad's comment of not tolerating the situation, uh, what can I do to make it better? Um, it depends on what what lens you're speaking from. Are you a resident? Are you a, a faculty member? Are you a, an emergency physician? Um, I think that running through the briar patch is part of our job. Um, and I think that um, being early adopters um, and always thinking about what the next thing is is part of our job. And that's what you can do, is be an early adopter. Um, don't tolerate the status quo. Understand that there always has to be a better, and take your ego out of it. That's hard for me to say, to be honest with you, but take your ego out of it, which means that you can't memorize every medication. It's just not possible. Um, I've got more toxicologists who work for me than people, um, and they try and met, they memorize everything, but you can't do that. Right? We have to adopt technology, take our ego out of it, understand when technology is the right answer and when we need human adjudication. If I were to predict the future, I do not think that AI are gonna, is gonna replace doctors, but I do think that doctors who use AI are gonna replace doctors who don't. Okay, all right, one more question. Uh, how did you convince an institution of higher learning to gamble or start investing in an investment fund? Um, that's a great, question. Um, it was a very difficult series of conversations um, that started with, I can't do this anymore. 
uh, and then ended with, well, what do you want to do? And the answer was, I want to break things. So we had the ability to break things and also um, make money, right? So the, the venture capital is, is peculiar. I'm not a venture capitalist. I've learned a lot of acronyms in the last five years. Uh, but if you eat your own dog food, you de-risk an investment, um, you can make money. And we've proven that uh, because so far it's early, right? It's seven years for, for funds to actually show returns. Um, we've had 11 investments one is neutral the other ones have all increased and the one that we just uh monetized was a nine and a half times return so i, I think this is a good theory um and we'll see okay great well thank you uh, dr zane so much for your presentation and inspiring thoughts i'm still stuck on um, eat your own dog food, which I'll have to ask you about later. But nonetheless, I'll turn it back over to uh, Dan and Jason. And I hope all of you have a uh, informative and fun day. Thank you.